Good morning um, and thank you for joining me for Bible Light. I hope uh, I am live now. Good morning and uh, thank you for joining me this morning for Bible Light. Um, it's uh, good to be here. I always uh, enjoy Bible Light on Saturday morning. It's one of the things that I really look forward to. And Bible Light is really about us reading together the Bible and uh, just trying to open it up and understand uh, what those words in the Bible mean. The Bible should always, wherever possible, be read in community so that ideas can be shared and interpretations and understanding uh, can grow. Um, before we, we go on to, to look at the scripture, one of the ideas that's been put to me is perhaps we have Bible light a little bit more interactive by going on to Zoom. So as we go on today, if anyone uh, is interested in us doing Bible Light via Zoom, if you could uh, put a comment or message me, and perhaps we can set that up for next week, um, that, that might be quite interesting. I've used Zoom a few times and it can be really good for interaction. So um, rather than me just seeing comments and responding, perhaps uh, Zoom might be a better way forward. If you haven't got Zoom, it's very easy to download and, uh, and very easy to use too. Um, as we go along this morning, if you can put any comments uh, up on FaceTime, on uh, sorry Facebook, and um, we can think about those comments. Uh, it's not just about me answering questions because I don't have the answer to everything. And it'd be good this week, perhaps, if we could um, hear more of your comments and your thoughts, um, not just just questions. Um, so I'm going to begin now by reading our uh, reading. It's taken from John's Gospel, chapter 20. Um, it's a very famous story of Thomas and Jesus and what is called Doubting Thomas. And we're going to think about Thomas, we're going to think about Jesus entering the room with the closed doors and really try to get to grips with what this encounter, this story uh, brings to us. So, uh, morning Barry, good to see you. Um, yeah, my comments are working so I'm quite relieved about that. It was, it was very quiet then. But, uh, starting to get people coming in. So I'm reading from John's Gospel, um, chapter 20, verse 19 to the end of, of that chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails on my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Let's take a few moments to think about those words and what strikes you about them, what queries that raises for you. Uh, morning, Kath, and uh, morning, Martin. Thank you for joining me. Hope you've got plenty of comments and thoughts.
So we've heard John's, <coughs> John's account um, of Jesus encountering Thomas. It's a story of Jesus entering rooms, not through doors, but just appearing. It's a story of him showing his wounds, the wounds of the crucifixion, the wounds that caused his death to his disciples. It's a story of doubt, of questioning. And until Thomas sees, he doesn't believe. I wonder what thoughts that raises for you. I think Barry uh, makes a good point here. Oh, good morning, Anne. Um, Barry makes a good point here. Um, do some believers who also doubt, what do people think about that? As many of us who are believers, do we doubt and should we doubt? Is it wrong to doubt? Is it wrong to admit that we have questions? Wrong to admit that we're not sure about things? What do you think? Hopefully some comments will come flowing through any minute. I've been used to sitting here with the sun streaming on my face from the study window, but today it's pretty miserable out there. So we're in the best place, thinking about the Bible inside. Hopefully you've got a cup of tea or coffee and, uh, and are comfortable. Eve is also asking, is Jesus a human at this point, as he was before he died? Hopefully we can get some comments on that too, because that, I think for many, is one of the issues where the doubt arises, where it's difficult to believe. So what do we think? What do we think? Is it okay to doubt? Is it okay to question and to think, well, it just doesn't seem right to me? Is that okay? all seem very shy this morning. Well, if I start you off by telling you what I think, I think doubt is probably one of the most important parts of our faith. Doubt is where our faith grows as we question. If we don't doubt, uh, Martin just said it's not wrong to doubt. Doubt makes you think. Some would say seeing is believing. Yes, thank you, Martin. I'd agree. And I, I think doubt really is fundamental to us developing our faith and understanding. And as Anne says, um, so many unbelievers turn to science explaining everything today. And yet good science is really about having doubts. It's questioning. Science only moves on because people question, because the scientists want to understand more and so they question and they try to really pull apart what other people have said. And it's the same with faith. Our faith is something that we need to question. We need to really get to grips with. And that's the whole idea of Bible lights. And in my curacy in Warsaw, and the, and the vicar there, Mark, set up a group called the Doubt Group, allowing people to ask those questions and out of that grew a lot of people with very deep faith. People who thought they hadn't got a faith because they'd got questions, but actually that's not right. We should have questions. So Martin's quite right. Doubt does grow our faith and our, our doubts are what really keep us going in our faith. Those questions, those challenges that, that we face. So, so thank you, um, I, I think that's really important. And so then we come on to the first issue that he brings up. Is Jesus a human at this point? The point that he arrives in the room, the resurrected Jesus. Is he the same as he was before he died? What do people think about that? What is Jesus a ghost? Jesus a spirit? Jesus physical? What is Jesus at this point? Oh, thank you, Martin. Martin's saying that his calling to ALM came from doubt. He's calling to, to serve in church. And I, I think my experience was the same, really. Um, I had a, 
<laughs> very long history of doubt. Um, I would have said at the time it was certainty that there wasn't a God, but actually it was a doubt about what life was on. And likes the idea of a doubters group. I think it's a really strong group. Um, and most of those doubters didn't come from it within the church. They were people um, from Walsall Town who, some of them were quite angry about faith and um, and thought that they really liked to, to quiz the vicar, I think. Um, and from that, a, a strong group grew. Yeah. So this, this question about Jesus. Jesus, was he flesh? Was he spirit? Was he the same as before? What do we think? Don't be shy. In Bible light on a Saturday morning when we're all sitting around in St Peter's, there's not much shyness there. People are very happy to uh, come forth with their ideas. And, uh, and as a vicar, it's a real privilege because I've learned so much from other people um, about their views. Uh, it's not a one-way process, this. Um, so what, what do people think? Thank you, Kath. I've got lots of thoughts, but first I was thinking about the climate of fear the disciples must have been in fear of being linked to Jesus. Perhaps part of Thomas's doubting was fear of what it would uh, what it would mean if Jesus was alive again. Yeah. Barry saying turn science during these troubled times with all the scientific advisor telling us to do, we believe they are right. Or do we, do we believe them? Do we believe them? And Martin, going back to the original question, is saying spirit. So Kath, we'll come back to you and to you, Barry. Martin saying that Jesus um, at this time is spirit. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because Jesus suddenly appears. But I think what Eve is getting at is possibly that he showed them the holes in his hands and his side. And actually Thomas puts his hand in his side. There's a physicality to it. We also know that Jesus goes on to share meals with them, physical meals. So is Jesus physically there as flesh or is he purely spirit? The truth is, we don't know, but it's good to question that. It's good to think about it. I think if we think in, in terms of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that's something that's quite difficult for, for us to understand and get our heads around. But this might be an example that helps with that. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. This might be an example that helps with that because this is about the physicality of Jesus being present, but also present in spirit. And the Holy Trinity isn't about God being a subject, God being an object, a substance. This is about God being relationship, relational, being love. And what we're seeing in this situation is Jesus being there in both body and spirit. We're seeing those two working, intermingling, being part of what's often called the dance of the Trinity and being in that dance with the disciples, including the minute, breathing the spirit. It's all part of that network of how we interact with God in those different ways, through spirit, through the understanding of physicality, through, um, through uh, not understanding fully, but our belief and accepting and so I think this idea that Jesus is unchanged cannot be right. I think Jesus is changed. We know that Jesus has lived, he's died, and he's risen again. And that's important because if Jesus hasn't died, he hasn't risen again. He's died because of those wounds, because of the suffocation he's had on the cross. And he's back with his disciples, risen. He's bound to be changed. He won't be exactly the same. So I think Eve's question gives us a really good kind of basis for thinking about the Trinity and thinking about the relationship of Jesus 
with his disciples. We're going to go on to think, be thinking over the next a few days about the relationship between Jesus and the women, between Jesus and the disciples, Jesus and people he meets on the road, at meals, and, and it's all about relationship at this time. So, what else have we got here? Oh, Barry's got trouble with predicted text. I know the feeling, Barry. <laughs> I've dropped some corkers with predicted text. So what you were saying earlier, um, they are right, or do, or do we doubt them? Um, should we doubt the scientists? Um, I think we should always, as I say, ask questions. In this current context, we are right to ask questions, to want to understand what is right and what is wrong. We hear a lot of words and a lot of promises that some not being held to, which is very worrying. So we're right to ask those questions. And as church, we should be asking those questions. Um, we should be trying to understand what's, what's going on. Um, just going back to uh, Kath's question here. Um, the climate of fear that the disciples were in. <clears throat> um, and this worry that they would be going back to how it was before. There is clearly a significant... Um, I'm sorry. My phone's ringing, sorry. There's clearly a significant um, fear around because they, they're worried that the Pharisees, the people in power, are going to try and hunt Jesus out um, and do the same to him. Um, also, that they are going to be persecuted themselves. And that's the truth. That's what happens, isn't it? They are persecuted. Um, so it is very, very challenging for them to, um, to, to, to be back in the open world, to, to be out there. Um, and perhaps some of them want to think this is all over. It's all gone and let's just shove it away. That's what happened with other messiahs, other people who are called messiah, and that's when um, their followings died and drifted away. That's perhaps what's starting to happen here, but then Christ is risen, and so they stick together. They gain courage from their belief and their knowing that this is completely different. This is world-changing. This is historical. Nothing else has happened like this, and so, I think that, um, Kath, this is um, really a time for doubt and for fear, as it is in our current time, as Barry points out to us. Um, but it's right to ask those questions. It's right for us to be challenging um, what this all means. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, Kath goes on to say that if Jesus is God, he can be anything and everything as he wants, human divine spirit quite right yeah and that's that's the reality of of the the trinity i think for me um that this dance between spirit and humanity and god it's all about god being god yeah i agree entirely um okay uh, Anne says maybe dawkins has a lot to answer for um i'm still hoping to gain believes in my family well, I would recommend, if you get a chance, go onto YouTube and watch Richard Dawkins with um, Rowan Williams and their debate. I, I think Dawkins actually believes. I don't think he's an atheist. I think he understands that there is something out there. And it starts to become clear um, in his relationship with Rowan Williams in that um, uh, debate that they have, that discussion. Um, Dawkins has got a very clear view, his reductionist view of um, uh, evolution. I don't think any of us have an issue with evolution um, these days. We understand that things have changed as our faith changes. Um, and I can understand why people would want to, to say, you know, this isn't happening, um, this, this faith, it, it's a theory that doesn't work. When we have a a rational, enlightened view uh, of everything, wanting proof. Um, and that's where he's come from. Um, gosh, they're, they're really rocketing now. I'm losing all the uh, <laughs> losing all the comments. Sorry, I'm not keeping up. I do apologise. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so only by doubting can you truly believe. It's not a negative thing and should be expressed. Gosh, yes, definitely. Um, Jesus seems to welcome doubt. He does. He does. And that's really important to say. Jesus does welcome it. He doesn't tell Thomas off. He doesn't have a go at people for not believing. He gently walks with them. And I think the best example for that for me is the rich young man who goes to Jesus and says, you know, I keep the commandments. Why can't I be one of yours? And Jesus is very gentle with him. He doesn't say you can't be. He says you have a choice to make. You have a choice. And that means you're giving up something in order that you can be, be a follower of me and understand what that means. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Jesus seems to welcome doubt and doubters and emphasizes, emphasizes the positivity of having faith in things we cannot see or understand. And a whole world has grown upon that of mysticism, the mystics. And the mystics are seen as some kind of on the edge, fluffy, or, you know, they, they'll believe anything. But actually, the mystical is based on a real sound understanding of faith. If ever you get a chance to read um, anything by a guy called Richard Raw, I would recommend it. If you like um, Rob Bell's work, um, then you would like Richard Raw. Richard Raw is um, a Franciscan um, Catholic priest, but has an amazing understanding um, of mysticism and really lays it out very clearly. Um, a lot of the works of, of um, Merton as well. It really is very interesting area, something that I think we've lost, sadly, um, certainly in the parts of Church of England I've been in. Uh, and that's where we can really immerse ourselves in, in spirituality. Um, yeah, there's no, so thank you for that, Kate. Yeah, yeah. Do you think the other disciples had doubts, but only Thomas was brave enough to speak out? <laughs> I think that's exactly as we are. I think people watching this will have questions, but it takes courage to ask a question. We often think, oh, I'm going to be seen as silly. No question is silly. Those questions are really important. Each question that's been asked will have been something someone else wanted to ask or what someone else wanted to comment. And it takes brave people, people with integrity, to, to do that. People who haven't been quashed in the past, people who um, haven't been told that they're silly. And our society's not done a really good job of empowering people to ask questions. Um, my days in education, I can remember many times being made to look silly for questions I asked that, looking back, they were perfectly reasonable questions. And I think the church has done the same. And we need to reverse that. We need to encourage people to ask questions. Thomas was, for me, not a doubting Thomas, but a Thomas with integrity, who was brave enough to ask those questions. And I'm guessing all the other disciples would have had similar questions. Plus, they'd experienced Jesus before. They'd seen the wounds before. Thomas hadn't. Yeah. Um, Richard. Hello, Richard. Um, when he first came to faith, um, defined, the faith was defined by what he didn't believe rather than what he did believe. I wasn't sure what was right, just that many things in life felt wrong. And ten years later, after a formational experience, I'm not sure anything has changed. Obviously, there are a few central things that you need to sign up to along the way, but alongside those, the questioning is fundamental and fun. Asking questions is no, in no way denies faith. It enhances it, it confirms it. Yes, definitely, um, 100%. Um, I think I have a similar experience and the, the, the disadvantage of being a vicar, and you'll find this soon, Richard, is that people think that you know everything or that you'll have answers. Being a vicar, you have far more questions then you do answers because the more you're immersed in faith the more you're immersed in people's spiritual journeys the more you realize that you don't know and that's why i learned so much from your comments from the interaction of bible lights um yeah gosh yes definitely um 
Oh, the book's on. Um, it's Richard Raw. Um, what I'll do at the end of this is I'll put some titles up in the comment of some books by Richard Raw. Um, they're very easy reading. Um, he does quite a bit of work with Rob Bell. If you know Rob Bell, the Numa videos and Velvet Elvis. Um, and it is well worth. He's also on YouTube. He does quite a bit on YouTube, um, or did in the past. I don't think he does as much now. And he's from Albuquerque in, uh, in the United States. He's very, very good. Um, Richard, uh, Stanley Hauvas says, our claim is not that our tradition will make sense or will help the world to run more smoothly. Our claim is just that it happens to be true. Good old Stan. It's, yeah, it's also Stanley Hauvas that um, he's, a, he's an American Methodist, um, Stanley. Um, and he says that you should read Bible in community. He will be very happy that we're doing this discussion today. Um, but yeah, our, our claim is not that a tradition will make sense. Um, our claim is that what we believe is true. What happens is true. Um, our whole faith in the Church of England um, is based on our tradition. It's based on our reasoning. And it's based on scripture. What we also need to recognise, it's also based on our experience, our experience of church and of life and of God. Um, and that's what it is for those disciples as well. They're grappling with all those things. Their reasoning is, how can this man appear in, in the midst of us? How, how is this possible? Our tradition tells us that a Messiah will come, but we didn't expect it to look like this. Um, and scripture has said that this Messiah will come. But again, surely this will be a king, not who comes in on a donkey, but a king in robes, someone who is great and mighty and who the Pharisees will follow. So it really is very, very um, challenging for them. Um, Martin, I've lost the thread. You said yes, they did, but I'm not sure what that was to. I am sorry. If it's in conversation, you can keep tabs on things, but when it's comments, it's quite quite difficult. So let, let's just let's just summarise then. What have we done? We've looked at um, the fact that there was fear and that they were um, away in a room and that Jesus just appears to them. And is that a Jesus who is human or spirit? And we we think that that's a little bit about both and that. Jesus is God and so God can do anything he wants to. We thought about doubt and that doubt isn't a negative thing, it's actually quite positive, it helps move us on, helps us to develop our faith, that questioning, that's where we learn from. Um, and it's what inspires us to read more, it's what inspires us to listen, um, to ask questions. Um, I just wonder what else there is in there that, that strikes you, that makes you, you think. Um, and perhaps relates to today's situation in, in lockdown, because that's where the disciples were in lockdown. Oh yeah, it wasn't, thanks Martin, it wasn't just Thomas who doubted. No, it wasn't. No, they all doubted. They did. So are there any th other thoughts from that? We're, we're sort of halfway through our time. I'm just wondering whether it's worth me reading it again to remind you, because normally in Bible, like we each have a, the same copy of the Bible together. And um, clearly we haven't got that. So I'm just going to reread it. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them. When Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. 
Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Okay. <clears throat> how can we embrace, and this is Anne, how can we embrace other faiths as we all believe in a peaceful living God? Oh, where's it gone? How can we embrace other faiths? Questions on a postcard, please. How can we? What do you think? It's a really important question in this, these times. Um, I think it's a defining question of who we are as Christians. How can we embrace other faiths? Should we embrace other faiths? What do you think? As you're mulling that over, um, I think Joe makes a really good point um, in response to, to Kath that, yeah, I know that feeling too, Joe, um, that sometimes we say something and you might, feel, um, you might feel silly or think that other people think that you're silly. So uh, it is really very uh, challenging. Um, sometimes we do do something and then don't. We want to do it, but we don't. Um, yeah, I'd agree. Um, Martin um, his appearing to the 12 um, or to the 11 was to show his love for them and sort of put his arms around them to reassure them to try to remove some of that doubt definitely definitely and I, I think particularly so in the Gospel of John because in John 14 he tells them he's going away uh, to prepare rooms for them um, but he'll be back and he's back so I think that's a really good summary of that, Martin. Yeah. Um, ah, well spotted, Kath. Just noted, noticed when I reread it that this pre-Pentecost giving of Holy Spirit and Jesus seeming to commission them to do his work. That's very interesting, isn't it? In the other three Gospels, um, they all go off to wait um, in Jerusalem for the time of the Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, in John, it does appear that in John 20, he's commissioning the disciples already. He's breathing on them and they're receiving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that's within them is being allowed to do its work. And so it seems like at that point, he's setting up the church. Um, and that's quite challenging. For many people, it's Luke who goes on in his second gospel, which is called Acts, to talk about Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. Um, that's a, a, another celebration that went on in the Jewish year. Um, and it was the time that the Holy Spirit um, blew through the doors like a rushing wind and appeared like flames on the heads of the disciples. Excuse me. <coughs> it's not a new cough, it's okay. Um, so, why does John pick on this time? Um, and, I, and I think it's because John is compressing things together. I think he's bringing things into a, a much tighter framework. Um, whether John actually witnessed that, we'll, we'll never know. We, we, we don't know, but I, I, I find it quite interesting. I have to say that for me, John's gospel at this point has real resonance because I can't see Jesus moving off and just leaving them floundering again. I think Jesus would have commissioned them there and then in the flesh. And so I think this, this chapter, John 20, that you just picked out here, Kath, is really quite important for the disciples and for that journey. 
and where they go on for. Thomas in particular goes on and travels as an apostle and it's believed traditionally he's seen as the patron saint of India and um, that he traveled to Kerala and um, took took the gospel out. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what evidence there is of that, but yeah, it's, it's certainly a, uh, a challenging thing. And, and it's something that we need to think about. It's also a time that Jesus comes and um, shares his peace. And he's picking up on the, the same point here, um, definitely. Oh, it's Peter actually who's asking that. Why did they have to wait to Pentecost to receive the Spirit? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I'm not sure what, what's going on here. Um, I'm fairly sure that some of those disciples were blessed with the Spirit anyway. And it, it's how we understand the Spirit, really. Um, for me, the Holy Spirit is present within us all the time, but we suppress that spirit. And I think Jesus breathing upon them is the release of that spirit within them. And it's almost like a corporate release and understanding on Pentecost. Um, but it is something that I haven't fully got my head around. Um, if I'm honest, it's something that I do question and, and uh, kind of grapple with. So I don't have any honest answers about that, but it's something that's worth exploring and thinking about. And particularly as we move up to Pentecost, <clears throat> perhaps we can rethink about that uh, as we explore that Pentecost. Hopefully we'll be back in um, church and we'll be sitting around with our cups of tea together. But um, yeah, hopefully we can we can relook at that. Um, going back to the other faiths, um, Eve says, um, I think we should embrace other faiths. No reason why the Christian faith is the only defining one. I believe there is one God, and many religions also believe that. They perhaps access God in other ways. Um, Eve, I would agree. Um, we know that God of Judaism, God of Christianity, God of Islam is the Abrahamic God. It's one God. Um, why isn't that God the God for all of the other people who believe in different faiths? Just different um, understandings, different religion, different traditions, different ways of worship. Um, there are different emphases in different um, faiths, and some of those emphases I would have trouble with. And so, having looked at a number of different faiths, for me, Christianity is the one that really does focus on relationship and love. And so for me, that's what, it, it's Jesus and Christ that really are the attractors to me to, to a faith in Christianity. Um, but having said that, I think we should embrace all faiths. I, I, I visited several different faith groups and I note and can see that the spirit works with them just as it does with us. Um, they have the same trials, the same um, problems, the same joys, um, but the emphasis is, is, is different. Yeah. Uh, and Richard um, explains very clearly um, and, uh, and reminds us that the Holy Spirit was knocking about from Genesis 1 um, over the water. The Holy Spirit has always been there. Um, there seems like a kind of a, I don't know, almost a, a tradition that the Holy Spirit is wafting around somewhere over there and that some priests or some people can call the Holy Spirit in. The Holy Spirit is here, the breath of God. We are filled with the breath of God. We breathe. And again, go back to Rob Bell and read Rob Bell about this. He's very clear, um, as is Richard Raw, that actually the spirit is within us, but we suppress the spirit. We won't let the spirit out. Um, 
so the spirit is always present with us we're never ever alone but we've got to recognize that and sometimes we think that um, our spirit the spirit um, we've got to have singing and dancing and be standing up to fall over and all weird and wonderful things because of the Holy Spirit it's not about that the Holy Spirit does powerful things it's reduced me to tears on occasions but it's not always like that and in a discussion yesterday talking about the gifts of the Spirit those gifts change over time as we move on in our faith the gifts of Spirit whether um, I, if you've heard of speaking in tongues or understanding tongues prophecy teaching knowledge all of those things will change and develop as we move on um, Hang on, I've lost my thread again, I am sorry. Um, yes, we should embrace our faiths, other faiths and people of no faith, um, as long as they live in a peaceful, living, loving way towards others. My difficulty with religion is that the differences in denominations can make unnecessary divisions, oh yes, um, between us as one human race. This isn't really about religion, this is about faith. Um, and I think that's a big, issue for us and people often um, see religion as as a tradition Re religion is re-ligamenting re-putting back together religion should be this is religion today we are putting back together the story of who we are and who god is that's what religion is about it's not about the traditions that we have of worship that's part of it but only a small part of it religion is about how we conduct ourselves in community how we conduct ourselves in relationship in love that's what religion is about and that is based on a faith the faith of peace as Jesus comes amongst those disciples and said peace be with you it's up to us to share that peace it's up to us to forgive because if we don't don't forgive as it says in in John 20 those sins are retained those sins are not forgiven so it's really very very difficult if um, we kind of merge the two um, and religion is blamed for many many things many things um, one of the religions that causes a lot of problems is also science science has caused many problems too although um, Dawkins would deny that. Um, I think science has been responsible for some real travesties, just as faith has, religion has. So yeah, thanks Kat. Gosh, I've got a long list here. This is, it could be on till 12 o'clock here. Um, yeah. Um, why is it that we don't accept the spirit within us? Um, I think There's a very good book written by Chris Urquhart that talks about the overflowing of the spirit. And we burden ourselves with so much and hold on to so much from the past. That's what won't let the spirit out. It's when we are really honest with ourselves, when we open up, when we allow the spirit to flow. And it flows most at our greatest times of vulnerability. As human beings, particularly as British, we don't like to be vulnerable. It's when we're most vulnerable that the spirit flows, that our tears well up, we cry, we laugh. It's when we are those vulnerable times that we are closest to God and the spirit flows. And I think we try, we just hold it in because we are tough people. We can hold it in. We can, we can control this ourselves. When we give over control, when we say to God, in your hands, that's when the spirit moves and when we feel that difference. For some, it's when you go to communion and you feel that warmth as you remember and as you open yourselves to God. That's why I think it is. Um, if you believe we only come to God through Jesus, how can other faiths reach God? Um, and why be a Christian if we can all reach God in other ways? Um, I, I think that's a, a, a an issue that is about faith. 
Um, I believe that I come to God through Jesus, through the resurrection. That's how I come to God. Um, for other people, it's through the word of scripture. And scripture is for them God. Um, in Christian terms, I mean. And for other people, um, such as Muslims, then the Quran is definitely um, the word of God and has to be treated as such. And so people come to God in different ways. Um, some come through the Spirit, some come through um, Jesus, some direct through God. Um, now, if you're thinking particularly of John 14, um, I am the way, the truth and the life. Um, what Jesus is saying, I think, is that he is teaching the way, the truth and the life. And if you follow the way, the truth and the life, which is about forgiveness, about healing, about love, about peace, then you will reach God. I'm not sure that people are excluded because they don't know Jesus. I'm not sure that that is the case. It could be. I could be completely wrong. But I've always struggled with the people around the world who've never had a chance to know Jesus. And I don't believe that God would exclude them because they wouldn't have known Jesus. I'm not sure. I don't believe that God would have excluded all of the people before the time of Jesus. And that's what challenges me, if I'm being honest. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, did Jesus breathe on them to relieve their fear and calm their minds? By the time of Pentecost, they'd be much stronger in their faith and ready to be sent out. It was a time of preparation for you. Kate, I think that is a very, very good explanation. Yeah, I, I think that is a really good explanation. Because they are in the grips of fear. They need some courage to regroup and to go forwards. They need the strength of the spirit and they are giving themselves up to God. I think that's a very good point. I've not thought of that before. I've not heard that before, but yeah. Yeah. So that when Jesus comes into the room and he breathes the Spirit on them, it really is giving them that courage, the courage of the Spirit to, to move forwards. Um, and then at Pentecost, as a corporate unit, as all of them together, they are blessed with the Spirit. Again, the Spirit is released and they are ready to move forwards and go into their work. Yeah. Yes, I agree, Barry. It is good to, to embrace the faiths. Um, and I, I think it's good that the, the children see and experience other faiths. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, text wrong again. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so Sue's saying, uh, for me, it's about the difference with Christ still being with them pre-Pentecost and then after they were without him after the ascension just as Easter came after days of mourning God in the form of the Holy Spirit was again with them um, and they would never again sorry I'm going to open this up uh, and never again leave um, you have put it well Sue yeah I think you have put it well because it is um, about them going through a process, a bit like Kate's just said, it's about a journey, isn't it? And about them having the confidence that Jesus remains with them, that Christ remains with them through that journey. Now, Jesus has told them, he tells them many times in the Gospel of John that the uh, comforter, the paraclete, will be with them. But do they really believe that? Do they really understand it? Um, I mean, Peter says, that he understands that he'll never leave God, that he'll never leave Jesus and he'll be there to the end. And what does he do? Off he hops. As soon as the trouble comes, Peter's gone, denies Jesus three times. All the other disciples gone too. And so Jesus knows that they need a little bit more than just, um, just to have seen him. They need some more strength. And so I, I think well, what Sue's describing there, going from, only through 
pre-crucifixion, crucifixion death, the risen Christ, through that whole process up until ascension where Jesus goes again and then into Pentecost. It's such a turbulent time for them. Um, I mean, we think we're in turbulent times now, but gosh, those disciples really went through tough times. So yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point, Sue. Yeah. You're getting worn out now, so am I. <laughs> um, one of the words that's used on a couple of occasions, and I haven't mentioned it, um, is Jesus brings his peace. Um, what do you think that means? The peace of Christ. What does that mean? Something we share on Sundays, the peace. But I think it's something that I don't know. I don't think we focus on what peace really is. I think we treat it a little bit superficially. What is that peace? I think it links to what we're saying about the Holy Spirit as well and not releasing the Holy Spirit. While you're thinking about this, if you can also think about my question at the beginning, because there's more people with us now. Um, I think we've got 10 people viewing, which is brilliant. Um, my question about Zoom and whether you'd want to do more interactive um, Bible discussion on Zoom. If, if, you, if you did, then let me know by message or comment today. question of peace. What is peace? It is passing God's love to one another. It is. But what does that mean? What does it mean to pass God's love? Is that what we do on a Sunday morning really? Peace is what can be one of the most tangible feelings of God. Christians can have, particularly when you're not new to faith or developing your faith, always noted in Alpha. Thank you, Eve. Peace is, quite right, a tangible feeling, expression of God. It is. And it's when we are at peace that we're often at our most uh, vulnerable, um, it's when we're at peace that we have released all those things that call us, cause us turmoil. And that's when God can do God's work within us. That's when the Holy Spirit really works. When that peace is really with us. When we know that we're on the right lines, that we're doing the right things. We feel peace, we feel the Holy Spirit when we are doing God's work. We don't feel peace, we don't feel God's spirit when we're on the midst of an argument or when we're doing something that we know is wrong, but we do it anyway, when we're committing a sin. That's really an essential element of our faith, is to understand peace. And it's not just to receive peace, but it's to make peace. Peacekeepers, Keeping the peace is really easy. Keep your mouth shut. Making peace means that you've got to confront the issues and that you've got to work them through. Jesus was a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. And so peace is really very, very important. OK. Um, I've got one vote down for Zoom. Um, because it's intrusive and this is a better way to reflecting um, not being distracted by faces you have <laughs> you've got to be distracted by my face though I'm afraid <laughs> unless I just put the picture of a candle up and speak behind it I guess that might be better <laughs> um, 
Even when things go wrong in life, with God's peace, you may, may feel sad, but you'll still have an underlying feeling of contentment. That's really um, quite poignant, Eve, in these days. Doing so many funerals um, of late, where a lot of friends and family can't be present, um, I think being able to share that peace and help people be at peace, even though they're extremely sad, that's when God can work and when healing can take place. I, I think that really is very, very true. In these times of uncertainty, where we really don't know what's going on, um, where we hear one story and then it changes the next day, um, where we're in lockdown and we feel very powerless, has the potential to be a time when we experience peace because we are vulnerable. The alternative is react and become angry and become more and more anxious. And that's not helpful then. So I, I think peace is something we need to try to hold on to and work on through our own personal prayer and through our communication and relationships with others. So yes, I, I think that's a, a really important point. Um, I've got a vote for Zoom. Uh, Kath would like Zoom. Um... <laughs> Though Facebook um, gives you more time to think of a question Use for a sl useful for a slower folk. Gosh, Kath, I wouldn't have said that you were slower. Um, Okay, so it seems that people would prefer to, to stick as we are. Um, what I might do actually is start a Zoom group for people who are interested in Zoom um, and look at a focused thing and can continue this on a Saturday morning um, thinking about um, our scripture. I, I'm going to pull things to an end now because it's um, three minutes to 11 and um, I probably need to go and have a lie down because my head's spinning now. Um, this is far more difficult than doing it interactively on uh, in, a, in a group. Um, so I hope this morning that some of your doubts, um, you can start to question them more, you can start to have some confidence in asking those questions, um, and that we can think of in these times some peace. So let's um, just finish with a, a short prayer. Uh, before, before I pray, um, I'm in the middle of doing um, a series of Stations of the Resurrection, looking at the readings and reflecting on them. And they are at six o'clock each night. And they've been live until now. I'll be recording a few for the next few days. Um, but um, yeah, please um, join with me on those. Um, they are quite interesting, really, um, set out by the Church of England, but interesting format. So let's just pray. Loving God, in these uncertain times, we give thanks that we can meet together in this virtual way. We think of you, Lord, and remember that you are streaming with us continually as we are streaming with each other. You often feel virtual to us, and yet to those disciples on that day, you were a reality in body and spirit. And so we pray, Lord, as we move through our own lives, our own journeys, as we ask questions, as we gain the confidence to question, we pray, Lord, that we'll meet you in your spirit and in your physical being as we relate to other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good day. Stay in. Keep safe. And uh, I hope to see you um, next week. God's blessings.